Hey everybody, welcome to Slow City Church online at home. My name is Brent and I've got a few announcements for you before we start today. First announcement is this. Start Here Lunch is next Sunday, May 23rd, just after our 10.30 a.m. service at 1150 Laurel Lane. If you are new or new-ish to Slow City Church, this is a great opportunity to learn about the mission, vision, direction. You get to meet some of the staff and the team, connect with other new-ish people and eat a great meal. And so we'd love for you to sign up. You can sign up on the app, on the events tab, or at slowcity.church slash events. It's free and we encourage you to be a part of it. Coming up in just a few weeks is our marriage meetup. First ever one-time event for married couples, engaged couples on Wednesday night, May 26. We're going to spend time together around circle tables. There's going to be a panel discussion all about marriage, answering, talking, discussing anonymous things that we all face in our marriage. Things like conflict, money, finances, future, kids, uh, all the things. It's going to be a great, it, it's going to be fun for one, and it's going to be a great, uh, great thing that hopefully you and I will walk out going, man, that's really helpful for my marriage. Sign up for Marriage Meetup. I want to let you know that Slow City exists because of our collective generosity. And the truth is, generosity grows generosity. Just like compassion breeds compassion, generosity grows this generous spirit. And your generosity has leaked. Um, I got a story this past week from Family Care Network that said, hey, somebody showed up to our desk and wrote a check to support foster families and said, I heard about you through Slow City Church and the generous, um, the generous giving of those at Slow City. And I just wanna say thank you. Generosity grows and uh, because of your generosity, real things are happening um, and you're making a difference, not just in the walls of our church with all the things that need to get done throughout a given week, um, and all the ministries that are taking place, but real life-changing ministry throughout our, si our city. There are three ways that you can give. You can give online at slowcity.church slash give. You can give through the mobile app. If you haven't downloaded the app, make sure you do that. Um, click the Give tab, or you can give by dropping a check at 1261 Laurel Lane. Thanks so much for your generosity. We are excited to continue week two of our Goliath Must Fall series. We're so glad that you're here. No worth you pay 
Hey everybody, and welcome to Slow City Church at home, online, wherever you are. My name is Brent, and, uh, and I'm humbled to be one of the pastors here at Slow City, where this is a collection of people that is desiring to live the way of Jesus and bring hope to everyone. Uh, we love our community. We love this city. We love our neighbors. Um, we love our schools. We love being a part of the life um, of this community. And, and this week, before we jump into the sermon and just keep going on as uh, like business as usual, I think it's important that we acknowledge um, the tragedy that happened right here at, at home. Um, we're grieved and we're gutted over the loss of life. And we're praying for peace, for comfort, for strength, um, for God to just come around all of those involved in the shooting that took place this past Monday. Um, We're praying and believing that God is a God who is close to the brokenhearted, who lifts up family and friends and those who are crushed in spirit. We're praying specifically um, for Detective Benedetti's wife, 
and his two young kids. I can't imagine what they must be going through. We've seen an overwhelming community support um, and, and we just wanna continue to grieve with those who grieve, mourn with those who mourn, um, move, uh, m- be moved with empathy and compassion and, and be led by the grace and truth of Jesus. We want to walk the way of Jesus into every circumstance, into every broken heart. So before we jump in, I would love just to pray. Pray for our city, pray for our, our neighbors, pray for our friends, pray for those in, in uniform. Uh, let's pray. God, we thank you for today, and, and we acknowledge that every day is a gift. I'm reminded of James' words that, say, that says, life is but a vapor, a mist. And, um, and God, we, we recognize um, the, the precious gift that life is. We recognize the grief and the loss and the mourning um, in, in the wake of a tragedy like we've experienced, and we just ask that you would give us peace and comfort, that you would lead our city in peace, comfort, and healing, and that your presence, your presence, Jesus, your way of compassion and grace and empathy would lead our way forward. God, as we open up the scriptures today, would you open up our eyes? Would you open up our hearts? Would you open up our ears and speak directly to wherever we're sitting, standing, jogging, driving, listening today? We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I remember um, standing in the middle of my high school lobby. Um, there are kids going everywhere in between classes when my girlfriend at the time, her name was Kim, walks up to me and I'm excited. And uh, she walks up and she comes face to face with me and she looks me in the eyes and she says, Brent, it's not me, it's you. <laughs> and she breaks up with me in the middle of the high school lobby. I was moved with this deep, seated sadness, this deep embarrassment, and in the middle of everything and everyone and the buzz of high school, I started to cry. And I was so embarrassed and I ran to class. And um, have you ever been, have you ever been rejected? Uh, My son gave me uh, permission to share this story, but about a year and a half ago, he was gearing up for middle school and he was really excited about trying to go out for the middle school soccer team. Now, he is a great player and I love watching him play soccer and he practiced so hard. He went out and he was working out. He was getting stronger. He was getting in shape. He was working on his foot skills and, and he went out for tryouts every day this week and he wanted this really bad and we wanted it really bad for him. And then, you know, tryouts end and, and you wait, you sit through like the week of waiting of like them building the team. And, and the day came Friday afternoon where everybody received an envelope and he wanted to wait to share this moment with mom and dad. And so Keegan comes out to the car. Um, Jenna, my wife is sitting in the car waiting for him and she pulls out the camera and he goes, okay, here it is. And she has a camera on and he tears open the envelope and you can just see it on his face. You can see the pain on his face. You can hear the pain in his voice when he says, I didn't, I didn't make it. I didn't make the team. Have you ever not been picked? Have you ever been rejected? Have you ever not been chosen for the team, not been chosen for the job, not been chosen? To watch that pain, to watch that rejection on the, the face of your own child is, is painful, is really, really, really difficult. And today I wanna talk about this really, really, really real giant in each one of our lives. It's the giant of rejection. Now rejection defined is this, the dismissing of someone or something. The act of not accepting someone or something. To reject something is to dismiss it as inadequate. See, last week we began this series called Goliath Must Fall, where we've been walking through some of the big giants in our lives. We talked about fear last week. We're gonna talk about comfort and apathy next week. In a couple weeks, Skylar, our next gym pastor, is gonna be talking about anger. And, and today we are talking about this very real thing up against all of us that all of us face called rejection. This feeling of not being picked, of being dismissed, of being told or held in an arm's length that says you are inadequate. And we've been walking through the story of David and Goliath to, to, to see that there were many giants facing Israel. There were many giants that they were up against. Fear was one of them 
and rejection was up with them. And rejection was a very real part of David's life. We pick up the story. You know the story of David and Goliath. Shepherd boy, big giant, five stones, sling, hits him in the face. He, he dies. Um, everybody cheers. Everybody celebrates. Uh, the underdog wins. Uh, David overcomes Goliath. Um, but in the middle of the story are, are so many important moments that I don't want to rush past. So David is, um, where we pick up the story today, David is bringing supplies back and forth to the battle lines and, um, and he shows up and he hears the words of Goliath. He sees Goliath standing in the valley between two, two nations about to go, go to war and he recognizes the fear in all of the, the soldiers and he's moved with this courage. He steps up. And he speaks up and, and yet we see this string, this, uh, this pattern, these responses of rejection in David's life. My hope is that we take some courage today to see rejection fall. Let's pick up the story together. Um, in First uh, Samuel chapter 17, verse 28, it says this, David's older brother heard David speaking with the men and he burned with anger at David and he asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those very few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now, what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, the king, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this giant Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. And Saul then responded, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy. And he has been a warrior from his, from his youth. See, we see this pattern as David shows up to the battle lines, as David shows up bringing supplies and sustenance for the soldiers that he runs into this experience, this real experience of rejection. His older brother sees that he's there and his move, he's moved with anger and he says, what are you doing here? Why are you even speaking? Nobody wants you here. What, who's doing your, your petty job back at home? No, go, go home, go home. Why are you even speaking? David responds like, can't I even speak? His older brother attacks his character. He goes, I know who you are. You are just conceited. You're wicked at heart. You're just here to watch. You don't want a part of this. You have no part of this. Why are you here? You are inadequate. You don't matter. He goes to the king and he says, King Saul, like I, I'm here to fight. And, and he says, you're not able to fight. You're just a boy. See, David has this response. What have I done? Can I not even speak? I don't know about you, but when I step back from this scene, from this story and allow it to become personal and think back to my own circumstances, I resonate with the pain that David must have felt. I resonate with those feelings of rejection and inadequacy that, that I've been told or uh, that I've heard from the words of other people. From, from the t I, I get the tone of voice that's being spoken here, the criticism, the dismissal, and the overall feeling of you, you don't matter. What about you? Have you felt those things? Have you ever been rejected by others, by someone? Have you ever been made to feel like your presence didn't matter? Or worse, your presence actually made things worse? Have you ever hopped on social media and saw that um, everybody else was together and they were out at the beach at a bonfire, or they were out at that winery or they're all together and they're having a great time and you just felt excluded and rejection and, and, and that feeling of rejection? See, real rejection is very real and very painful. Even perceived rejection, perceived exclusion, not being invited is really, 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 really painful. Have you ever been there, pushed out, kept out, told, man, just go home, felt that way? See, David was there. And notice what he does. He gets rejection from his older brother, and then it says he turns away to somebody else. He goes to other men and he starts saying, hey, I'll fight, I'm here to help. And he goes to the king and says, hey, I'm, I'm here to help, I'm here to fight. And, and we have this tendency, don't we? When we get rejected in one place to go find rejection or to go find acceptance 
in other places. Rejection is deeply painful and deeply personal and feeling excluded is the worst and we can easily turn away and run away to find acceptance in other things. Maybe for you, you felt excluded and so you tried to find acceptance in a relationship or in a new group of people or a new scene or a new habit or a new pattern or a new worldview or a new like, you, you just changed like your, your wardrobe and you're just trying to fit in somewhere some, to, to be around somebody, something, some group of people that just says, I see you, I accept you, you're enough, you are adequate, you are, you are, you're, are, you're worth our time. See, David turns away to this person, to that person, but keeps finding rejection. Do you remember what Saul said to him? Saul said, you wanna fight that giant? You're not able to do this. Did you hear what he said? He said, you're just a boy. You're not a man. You're not enough. You're not big enough, fast enough, strong enough, more. You're not equipped enough. Like, who are you? You're not even a soldier. You're a shepherd. Like you're not, you're not able to go against this. You're just a boy. Do you feel this? Have you heard this about yourself? That stings, doesn't it? When you think about those times when somebody says, you're not, you're not enough. Just go home. You and I know this, but rejection is deeply painful. Rejection is deeply painful. The American Psychological Association has found evidence that the pain of being excluded is no different from the pain of physical injury. I want you to hear that again. The pain of being excluded and rejected and ostracized and held out is no different than the pain of physical injury. Rejection is painful and is a giant in our lives, something that you and I both face, can I ask you, how do you respond to rejection? Have you faced rejection in your life? What direction does rejection take you? Where does being rejected lead you? What direction does rejection take your life? See, the APA goes on to show that being rejected can have serious implications for an individual's psychological state and for society, for the community in general. They say social rejection can influence emotion, cognition, the way that we think, and even our physical health. This got me, ostracized people sometimes become aggressive and can turn violent on others or one's self. I found that to be interesting and true. Rejection can affect the whole community. Rejected people can, can, it can influence all of society, the way that we think, the way that we see ourselves, the way that we respond to others. And he says, rejected, being rejected by others can lead us in a dangerous direction to a place where we can ultimately be a, a threat to ourselves. See, we can feel rejection from others, both real or perceived, and then we can ultimately be rejected by ourself, rejected by self, rejected, like they have this, this um, self-rejection that we feel where we reject our own person. Robert Burton has this powerful quote. He says, you can't think worse of me than I do myself. You can't think any worse of me than I do of myself. There's nobody who can think worse of me than I think worse of me. I I think the worst about me. Have you ever found yourself there? Maybe you resonate with that. You've been rejected by others. You've been held at arm's length and it's led you in a direction that has you thinking less and less and less of yourself and worse and worse and worse of yourself. And now you're convinced that you just really aren't good enough. At the bottom of the barrel, you're thinking like, I'm not good enough and I'll never be. And self-rejection is this swarm of self-doubt and self-criticism meets self-pity and self-hatred. And it becomes this self-sabotage where we just sabotage ourselves as we reject ourselves, And it keeps us back and we we don't even try to do that thing we don't even step out in courage we don't even step forward to have that conversation we don't even try to do the thing that we think we might want to do because we just know and we're convinced i'm gonna fail so why try i'm not wanted or needed anyway i'm 
too flawed. This past week, my son and I are talking about him not making the team. And he says, yeah, dad, you got to tell that story because you made every team you ever tried out for, which is true. (laughs) It's true. Like I made every team I tried out for, but I told him, I said, dude, the reason I made every team I tried out for is because I had this deep seated fear of rejection that kept me from attempting anything I knew there was even a hint of failure in. I didn't try out for the football team. I didn't try out for high school basketball. I didn't try out for this thing and this thing. I didn't have that conversation. I didn't go here because I had this overwhelming fear of rejection and I had gotten to a place where I wrestled with self-rejection where I said, why? I'm not even gonna try that. I said, bro, you're a lot better than me because you're trying hard things. Have you ever been there? Have you ever experienced that? See, like, see this, this, this fear of rejection and this real inner dialogue that we wrestle with of self-rejection would often tells us like, you can't make it, so don't go for it. You don't matter, you're too small, you're not good enough, you're too inadequate, and it ultimately holds us back. It's held me back. See, this giant of rejection has ramifications for your life and mine, for your relationships and mine, for our future, for your, for your future. See, rejection of others and rejection of ourselves ultimately holds us back and it can harm, it can harm others. Someone once said, rejected people can easily reject other people. See, rejected people, when we are rejected by others and we reject ourselves, we can easily become people that we don't wanna be. And rejected people can easily reject other people. Those people who live here have a tendency to just hold everybody at an arm's length. And it's this defense mechanism, right? Like, I don't really wanna get to know you. I'm really not gonna trust you. I'm really gonna hold you far away. I'm really not gonna receive you and accept you because I'm afraid of being rejected myself. And we become rejected people who are rejecting other people. Maybe it's because we've never really known what it, what it means to be accepted and welcomed and received and valued and picked and chosen and loved. So we don't know how to value, how to choose, how to pick, how to value, how to love, how to welcome other people. And we can become this society of rejected people keeping everybody else at an arm's length and one of the greatest threats of this giant of rejection is that it can lead you and I in the direction of a rejected view of God almost like we have this reactive view of God where we have all this reject, reject, rejection around us and, and in us and around us and we can react and keep people at an arm's length, but we can ultimately keep God at an arm's length. They say, we say like, they rejected me, I reject me, I've rejected others, so God must reject me. Have you ever felt that? You know, like, or we can slip into this performance-based view of God where it's like, man, I've got to hustle and be perfect and be, and have all my stuff together so that God won't reject me. And I, and I step into every relationship and, and my view of God is like, I'm doing all of this so God won't, so, so that God won't reject me. Have you ever been there? Or we just get to a point where rejection is just so much a part of our story that we grow bitter, that we grow angry, that we grow closed off at a heart, mind, soul level, and we just push God away and reject the idea of God all together. Have you experienced this? Have you experienced rejection? Where does rejection direct your life? Where has it taken your relationships? Where has it taken your faith, your walk with God? Henry Nouwen kind of wraps all this together better better than I can. He says this, as soon as someone accuses me or criticizes me, as soon as I am rejected, left alone or abandoned, I find myself thinking, well, that proves once again that I am a nobody. My dark side says, I am no good. I deserve to be pushed aside, forgotten, rejected, and abandoned. See, self-rejection is the greatest enemy of the spiritual life, life with God, because it contradicts the sacred voice, the voice of God that calls us beloved, loved. He writes, being the loved ones of God 
constitutes the core truth of our existence. Back to 1 Samuel 17. David shows up to the battle lines. Goliath stands in the field. A giant is in the valley. And David speaks up and steps up. And then he's belittled. He's rejected. He's told you can't, you'll never, you don't matter. He is rejected. But I want you to notice David's direction in the face of rejection. I want you to notice this because David wasn't deterred by it. He wasn't dejected. He wasn't demoralized. He didn't hear the rejection and like turn it on himself. He didn't say, you rejected me, so now I'm gonna reject myself. And then he didn't return the rejection. He didn't go back to his brother and say, well, you rejected me, so I'm gonna reject you. And he didn't go to Saul and say, you rejected me, so I'm gonna talk down to you. And he doesn't direct it at God. He doesn't put it on God and react in that way, but he responds by speaking to Saul, the king, directly about what he knows to be the most true thing in his life. He speaks about where he's been, about what he's seen, about what he's learned about himself and about the Lord, about God. Look at what it says in verse 34 and 37. It says, but David said to Saul, I've been keeping my father's sheep. When a lion or a bear carried off the sheep, I went after the sheep and I rescued the sheep. When it turned on me, I struck it and I killed it. I've killed both the lion and the bear. This is who I am. This giant will be just like them. And he says in verse 37, it's the Lord who rescued me then. And it will be the Lord who will rescue me now from the hand of this giant. See, David responds to the rejection that he heard from his older brother, to rejection that he heard from the other soldiers, to the rejection that, he, that was spoken to him from the leader of his country, from the king. And he responds with this very real reminder, almost like it's, he's talking to himself. And he says, let me tell you, let me tell you that this is who I am and this is where I've been and this is who God is. See, this is who I am. My brothers, my brothers have always overlooked me. My brothers always got the easy jobs and I was forgotten. I was a shepherd in the fields, just watching sheep doing everybody's dirty work and they'd forget about me. I've been overlooked, overlooked and underestimated my entire life. I've been the youngest, I've been the smallest, but here's the deal, Saul. I know that I'm chosen because I know the Lord. I know his voice. I got to know him as I spent time alone while everybody else was doing everything and excluding me. I was protecting sheep and I was there alone with God when, when a lion or a bear would attack the sheep. It was just me and there was no one to protect me or give me courage. No one but the Lord. See, God was with me. The Lord rescued me then. And I know, I'm confident, he's faithful, he will rescue me now. See, this is who God is is he is able and strong. The Lord is the Lord who saw me then and who sees me now. The Lord is the one who chose me when I was spoken down to, who chose me when I was overlooked, who chose me when, when, when the prophet showed up and said, who, let me see all your sons. My dad forgot about me, left me in the field, but God anointed me. He knows my name. He knit me together. He has called me to something bigger and better. The Lord is the Lord who is with me Now, see, David, in the face of very real rejection, reminds himself of the reality that God was faithful, that God was able, that God was close, and that God chooses him, chose him, was with him, was present with him, and he remained confident in this. He would later write uh, Psalm 27. Psalm 27 says this, hear my voice when I call, Lord, Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn me away from you in anger. You have been my helper, Lord. Do not reject me or forsake me, God, my savior. Listen to this. Though my father and my mother forgot about me, forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes for false witnesses rise up against me. They tell me lies. They spout malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of God 
in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. See, David has this view of God. It's not reacting to all of the other rejections that he's faced in his life. He, ha- he is not receiving the rejection of his heart. He has this view of God that though his father and his mother and his brothers and his leaders and these soldiers have forsaken him, have rejected him, God is the God who receives him. God is the God who accepts him. He says, God is the God who welcomes me, who chooses me, who sees every part of me and still sees something in me, believes in me, is behind me, lifting me up and has goodness for me. And don't miss this. Don't miss this if you miss anything else. It's this reality, this remaining confidence in the face of rejection that ultimately frees David to step into his calling. And he walks out of the fight on behalf of those who rejected him. See, knowing you are accepted, loved, cherished, valued, known, chosen by God changes everything. And David experiences this acceptance. There's nothing more painful than rejection. There's nothing more freeing than acceptance. David gets it and it changes everything for him. Think about with me, uh, think about Jesus with me for, for just a minute. He's baptized. The heavens open up around Jesus 2,000 years ago and the father speaks to Jesus, speaks in the middle of this scene, they hear the voice and, and, and the father says, this is my son whom I love. I am pleased with him. Think about this. Jesus would encounter rejection in his life, betrayal in his life. His brothers and his family are embarrassed of him throughout his life. He'd face opposition and oppression like never before. And, ev- and, and even before Jesus ever begins his ministry, even before he ever turns water into wine, even before he ever heals the sick, before he walks on water, before he feeds thousands of people and teaches anything radical, God said to him, the father said to the son, you will face rejection, but you're not rejected. You will face rejection, but you're not rejected. He says, I'm proud of you. I see you. I choose you. I love you. It, and it was this. It was that reality, that reception, that acceptance that drove Jesus, that carried Jesus. It was this remaining confidence that held him together, that allowed him to live this not rejected, accepted life. And get this, it was that, hear me, stick with me. It was that not rejected life that Jesus lived that ultimately makes a way for your acceptance and my acceptance. See, because of this reality, because because Jesus steps to the cross, because Jesus is ultimately rejected and, and, and stretched out on a cross and nailed to it and dies and bleeds, it's because of this that you and I see ultimately that we, though we face rejection in our life, are not rejected by God. We are accepted by God. We are welcomed by God. We are loved by God. Paul, in the book of Ephesians, says this, praise God who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing because of Jesus. See, God chose us in Jesus before the creation of the world and calls us holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he chose us and adopted us to sonship through Jesus Christ. In Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, all by God's grace. See, Jesus, we see it in David, we see it in Jesus. Jesus had this remaining confidence that said, I'm not rejected though they have rejected me. God, you accept me. You chose me. You love me. And because of the cross, that acceptance, that not rejected life gets passed to you and I. I sat with a friend this past week who shared really vulnerably about his life in this steady stream of rejections. People said they'd stand up for him, that they'd back him, that they'd help him, 
ultimately bailed on him and let him uh, just kind of flail and left him burnt, left him just feeling wounded. And in that very real conversation where we shared some of our rejection stories, where we shared some of our not picked, forsaken kind of stories from other people and how we wrestle with this internally, I was just continuing to be struck. I was just struck by the reality that the most freeing thing for you and for me, the most freeing thing in the face of this very real giant of rejection, of all of this pain, the most freeing thing is that God, the God of all creation, the God who knit you and I together in our mother's womb, ultimately says, you're not rejected, you're accepted. I accept you through Jesus. I love you. I choose you. I redeem you. I forgive you. And though you will experience this pain, though you will experience exclusion personally and maybe internally, can I tell you, you are chosen. You are loved. You are not a reject. You are not rejected. You are accepted. And then he invites us. So live that way. Live accepted. Live accepted. See, maybe you've been up against this giant for a very long time. Maybe you've found yourself constantly being let down or rejected or excluded by others and it's caused you to have a damaged view of yourself and you're keeping everyone, including God, at an arm's length just to try and protect yourself. Or maybe you found yourself living this performance-based life so that everyone will accept you and you found yourself in harmful relationships and harmful patterns. Can I tell you that God in Jesus, bought a way for you to know that you are accepted, loved, redeemed, and forgiven. David had this remaining confidence that said, you may say I'm not enough. You may tell me that I'm just a boy. You may tell me to go home, but I'm here to tell you that God, who is on the throne, knows my name and says, I'm with you, I'm for you, I choose you. Jesus has this confidence throughout his life that says, God is pleased with me. He is proud of me. He loves me. He is with me. And though they slay me, God is on the throne and knows me by name and says, you are chosen. And now because of Jesus, you and I can say the same exact thing to not live a rejected life, but an accepted life. Do you know that acceptance? Maybe today for the first time in your life, you open up your hands and you say, God, help me to see all of the rejection and pain in my life and help me to receive the fact that you receive me. Help me to receive the reality that you accept me, forgive me, love me with all my failures and flaws. You say, I see this in you, I choose you, I adopt you, I call you my son and my daughter. You are not invaluable. You, uh, you, you are not, you are not, you, you have great value. You have great worth. And I, I love you. Maybe for you today, you just put out your hand and you say, I accept, I accept your acceptance of me, God. I accept your love for me, God. Father, help us as we face rejection, as we face real pain and exclusion, to not keep you in an arm's length, to not run, uh, to hunt for acceptance everywhere. Help us to turn our hearts to you and to come face to face with a God who while we were still sinning, died for us, who paid our ransom and who says, you are mine, I love you, I choose you. Be confident, trust me with your relationships, trust me with your words, trust me with your thoughts and your view of yourself. Would you bring it to me and receive? Help us to see, God, that we are not rejects. We are accepted. We love you and we thank you. We wanna see this giant of rejection fall in our lives. It's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.